What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Chasing Clarity Health and Fitness Podcast. This is your host, Brandon DeCruz, and today is episode 105, where we're going to discuss the science of food cravings. So food cravings are defined as an intense desire to consume a particular food or a type of food. And this desire is usually hard to resist. However, it's a temporary feeling. And cravings are something I'm sure you have all experienced, as research finds that food cravings occur in the majority of the population. Recent data also finds that the average person experiences food cravings on a frequent basis, including up to multiple times a week due to our modern food environment, which we recently discussed on an episode of the podcast. And research also finds that during 80 to 85% of these cravings episodes, people consume the crave food or similar food. Now, food cravings are most often felt and directed towards hyperplatable and or processed foods that contain concentrated combinations of sugar, salt, fat, and starch. And experiencing cravings is extremely common, especially in today's food environment, where hyperplatable and tasty foods are easily accessible at every supermarket, every checkout aisle, and constantly marketed in commercials and advertisements. And the vast majority of us have experienced cravings in the past, and most likely will experience experience them again in the future. We also see that different populations report experiencing cravings more than others. So for example, Women tend to report feeling cravings more than men do, and this is also most common in women with overweight and or obesity. There are also sex-specific differences in the types of foods that people crave. So research finds that women tend to report craving sweet foods more often, including things like chocolate and ice cream, whereas men report craving more savory items like meat and steak. Now, the issue with cravings is that the majority of the time, the foods we experience cravings for, the most and can't seem to get enough of once we do start eating them, are the types of foods that are most likely to derail us from our body composition and our health-related goals. And this is because the most commonly reported foods that individuals experience cravings for are highly processed, hyperplatable foods that provide us with an excess of calories and are usually packed with ingredients and items like sugar, fat, and salt, yet they contain minimal micronutrient value very low protein and fiber content, and they aren't satiating, which makes them extremely easy to overeat and very difficult to moderate and control our intake of. So my goal in today's episode is to go over the science of cravings and cover how hunger and appetite and cravings differ, the incorrect theories regarding why food cravings occur, because there's a lot of claims out there as to why cravings come up or why we experience cravings that just do not have evidence behind them. And actually they mislead and misinform individuals in terms of understanding what a true craving is and what is developing or leading to us experiencing cravings. Then I'm going to go over what factors actually cause us to experience food cravings. I'm going to go through how food cravings impact calorie intake and our body composition, how dieting specifically impacts food cravings, which is a topic that is often uh, misattributed. So a lot of people think that dieting actually increases cravings, but we'll go over the data and also my own experience having worked with so many individuals and taking them through dieting phases in order to improve their body composition, their health, and their longevity. And then we're also going to go through why you crave certain foods more than others and which food triggers or foods trigger cravings the most. So that you all have a better understanding of food cravings and you can reduce your likelihood of experiencing them and prevent them from derailing your body composition progress moving forward. So the first topic I want to dive into on today's podcast is the difference between hunger and cravings. So hunger is the desire to eat and is described as an uncomfortable emptiness in the stomach. Now, hunger can come in two different forms which are homeostatic hunger and non-homeostatic hunger, which is also referred to as hedonic hunger. So let's start with homeostatic hunger because that's actually our true hunger. So homeostatic hunger is our true physiological hunger. And this occurs when our brain thinks that we need energy. So homeostatic hunger is regulated by our energy status and various satiety and hunger hormones that are impacted by both the nutrients we take in our meals and our body fat levels. So for example, one of the main hormones that influences our homeostatic hunger is the hormone leptin, which is an indicator of our energy status, both in the short term, such as what we've eaten, and then energy status in the long term, in terms of our body fat levels, meaning our energy stores in our body. 
So homeostatic hunger is also influenced by our main hunger hormone, ghrelin, which acts as a meal initiator. Now, homeostatic hunger is nonspecific. So this is a form of hunger that can be suppressed and satiated by any food, as this is a true physiological need for energy, aka calories. So it's not like we need a specific nutrient or a specific food source to satisfy and satiate homeostatic hunger. Now, on the other hand, non-homeostatic hunger, also referred to as hedonic hunger, refers to eating behaviors that are not done out of a physiological need for calories, and they're more psychologically driven. So an example of homeostatic hunger is when you feel compelled to eat due to a desire for pleasure, such as when you eat a food because you're craving it, or when you turn to food for comfort after having a really stressful day. Like you come home from work and you turn to chocolate or ice cream or something to try to make yourself feel better or to try to find an escape for the uncomfortable emotions that you're experiencing. Now, hedonic eating is heavily influenced by the neurotransmitter and hormone dopamine which influences our wanting and liking of foods and drive the cravings we experience. And this is because when we eat foods we crave, it causes a very large release of dopamine in the brain, which activates the reward pathways of our brain, which causes us to want and desire these specific foods both in the moment and in the future, as dopamine drives our motivation to seek specific foods that provide us with a large amount of food reward. So when you indulge in a craving, you're giving into hedonic hunger, not homeostatic hunger. Now, physiological hunger is how our bodies tell our brains that it needs energy. And we experience hunger when the hunger hormone ghrelin is secreted, which signals to our hypothalamus in our brain that we need to eat. And an easy way to think about and understand hunger is from an evolutionary perspective, as essentially hunger was a survival mechanism we developed to drive us to go out and find food to survive. However, hunger only tells our brain that we need to eat, not that we need to eat specific things, which is more than to realize, as this is what differentiates true hunger from actual cravings. Cravings are desire for specific foods and are a form of psychological hunger rather than, than physiological hunger. So cravings can often be triggered in the, in the complete absence of actual true physiological hunger, such as during times of stress, sadness, and anxiety, and are not something our body needs to give into to survive, just something that may make us feel temporarily better in the moment. And when it comes to managing your cravings, you first need to realize that cravings come from a psychological drive to eat pleasurable foods. So in turn, cravings are a desire, not a need, as there are no physiological mechanisms in the body that cause us to desire a very specific and very particular food, which is a massive misconception many have about cravings, where they believe that their cravings are signaling that their body needs a certain nutrient from a specific food, such as chocolate. And the issue with giving into cravings is that they activate the reward pathway in the brain, which is linked to dopamine. So the more you give into your cravings, the more you activate this reward network in your brain, which can only cause a greater increase in, creating, in cravings in terms of frequency and severity, which is why it's incorrect to think that you'll be able to diminish cravings and satisfy them by feeding them. Because actually, in actuality, you're setting off a cascade of events which actually cause a greater wanting and a greater likelihood to experience cravings for those foods when you consume them. So instead of thinking about the, the concept of satisfying your cravings, it would more so be more appropriate. And then the literature that actually say this is to starve your cravings if your goal is to actually reduce your likelihood of experiencing cravings. So let's go through some of the incorrect theories around the causes of food cravings. There are a lot of claims that are thrown around regarding the causes of food cravings that, like, that lack scientific evidence to back them up. Two of the main misconceptions that many individuals have around the cause of food cravings is that we experience cravings due to either micronutrient deficiencies in our diet or and or changes in hormones, such as during pregnancy or during the menstrual cycle. So let's look through both of these claims. First, many are under the belief that if you crave a certain food, that it's because you're deficient in a certain nutrient that that specific food you're craving contains. First and foremost, this claim doesn't even pass the sniff test because if you look at the most commonly craved foods, they're highly processed, hyperplayable foods that have very low vitamin and mineral content. So these are generally micronutrient devoid foods. So if cravings were actually due to an actual nutrient deficiency, we would be more likely to have a very strong craving for micronutrient-rich foods like vegetables and fruits or items like kale and spinach and peppers, not for chocolate, cookies, cakes, ice cream, 
and other hyperplatable tasty items like donuts. However, even when we look into the scientific research on food cravings and micronutrient deficiencies, they claim that micronutrient deficiencies cause food cravings just does not hold up. So first and foremost, we do not have a taste for most micronutrients besides sodium or salt. So it's not like we can detect what micronutrients are in the foods that we eat. So to think that your chocolate craving is due to a micronutrient deficiency is honestly implausible. We also don't see people who do have micronutrient deficiencies experiencing cravings for foods that actually contain high amounts of micronutrients they're lacking. So an example of this is iron deficiency, which is also related to a condition called PICA which is where someone craves and chews ice despite ice having no nutrient density or value and not being a adequate source of iron. We even see that in some micronutrient deficiencies or in the case of some micronutrient deficiencies, they actually cause a loss of appetite, not an increase in appetite. So for example, zinc deficiency often causes a loss in appetite, not an increased craving for zinc containing foods. Now, the second theory that many have, and I've heard so many people um, claim this or believe this, is that we crave certain foods due to hormonal changes. And so this is essentially the most prominent and common claim. And a component of this that's extremely common and prominent and, and prevalent in our society is that women crave specific items due to different hormonal changes, such as when they're experiencing PMS or during pregnancy. Now, this is a claim that's very easy to believe because I'm sure we all have women in our lives which have told us that they've experienced chocolate cravings during their late luteal phase or during menstruation or during pregnancy, especially for those of us living in the States. However, it's really important to realize that correlation doesn't equal causation. So just because many women crave chocolate doesn't mean that the cause is due to the changes in their hormones. So let's first go through PMS. Although experiencing chocolate cravings during PMS is a very common occurrence, these are not hormonally mediated. They're actually a cultural phenomenon, which is much more common in women living in America than in other countries, which is something we not only see in research, but I can also confirm as I work with female clients around the world. And there are many countries where the women I work with don't get chocolate cravings during menstruation. So for example, in a 2004 study, that looked at chocolate cravings and the menstrual cycle in American and Spanish women who reported to be chocolate lovers, what they did was they went through the different countries and essentially looked at both American women and Spanish women to see their reports of chocolate cravings. And so when they asked these women if they crave chocolate perimenstrually, uh, American women were more likely than Spanish women to report that their chocolate cravings occurred during menstruation. With 40% of American women reporting chalky cravings as compared to only 4% of Spanish women. Then a more recent 2017 study investigated the role that one's culture plays in the creation of cravings and specifically looked at chalky cravings. And the research found that much of the evidence suggests that cravings are a cultural bound con construct. Almost 50% of American women crave chocolate specifically around the onset of menstruation. Whereas their study found that women born in countries outside of the US were significantly less likely to report menstrual cycle chocolate cravings, with only 17.3% of women outside of the states reporting that they crave chocolate during their menstrual cycle, which led them to state that research does not support popular accounts implicating physiological factors in menstrual chocolate craving etiology or the creation of uh, cravings. So these results suggest that ch craving chocolate during a woman's cycle is not due to physiological changes, but rather due to our culture and how chocolate has been looked at as a comfort food in America for decades, where many will use this to self-medicate when they're dealing with uncomfortable and unpleasant menstrual cycle-related symptoms. We also see that cravings differ both across cultures and across sexes. So a 1999 study looked at individuals born and raised in America and Spain and looked at the types of foods they craved most. In both cultures, the vast majority of females crave sweet foods more than savory foods, whereas on the other hand, males craved more savory foods more often than sweet foods. Now, among sweet cravers, chocolate craving was much more frequent for American females, with over 44% of American females reporting chocolate cravings as compared to only 17% of American males reporting chocolate cravings. But there were no gender differences in chocolate cravings between Spanish females and Spanish males, which is more evidence that chocolate cravings are culturally driven, not physiologically driven. 
Another common claim is that pregnancy causes chocolate cravings as well. Now, a, 20, uh, a 2014 study tested whether chocolate cravings during pregnancy were due to hormonal changes and due to a change in physiology, but this was found to be a psychological and cultural effect. In the study, they found that women in the United States experiencing an increase in, crave, in food cravings at two specific times during their life, which is around the menstrual cycle and prenatally. And although the presence of cravings during pregnancy is a common phenomenon across different cultures, the types of foods women crave during pregnancy differs based on the country they live in and their culture. So the reason why you experience cravings is not due to a nutrient deficiency or hormonal changes, but rather due to associated learning which is where we associate certain foods, especially hyperplatable tasty foods with pleasure, food reward, and stress reduction. And we've essentially ingrained and reinforced those patterns by having, you know, it could be from our childhood or it could just be from experiences in the past where you go through your menstrual cycle and you feel uncomfortable. So you turn to chalk and you feel better in that moment. And then you associate that feeling and that you know, essentially that feeling of relief with chocolate. And then you think that that's what's driving it. It's that it's, it's reverse causality, essentially, where you're looking at chocolate as a relief and the fact that you go to chocolate during your menstrual cycle as indication that this is, that your menstrual cycle is what's causing chocolate cravings, but actually it's a conditioned, it's a learned stimulus, essentially. So you've essentially conditioned yourself to look to chocolate during that time in the month as a resort or as a uh, form of self-medication. And really what we see is that countries around the world Yes, we do see that women tend to prefer more sweet items. However, when it comes to specifically chocolate cravings, this is really a U.S.-based phenomenon where a, a much higher, a much higher percentage of women in the states turn to chocolate as compared to women outside of the states. So we have to realize that it's not due to you're not experiencing cravings because you have a nutrient deficiency or due to your hormonal changes. It's due to many other factors, which we'll get into. So now that we've went over the common theories that are just incorrect about what causes cravings, I want to cover why we actually experience food cravings and what factors drive food cravings. So there is no underlying physiological process that takes place during a food craving. It's a mental process that starts in your brain and is triggered further by food cues and your food environment. And a craving can often start with hunger, which causes a desire for food then this hunger can take the shape of specific foods when food cues in your environment trigger the thought of specific foods. This can come from seeing a food visually, like in an advertisement or driving by a fast food joint, thinking about food, smelling a food, hearing about a food, or thinking about it. However, the foods we crave are often those we have had pleasurable experiences with in the past, which is why you'll notice and you'll just be able to see that you rarely experience a craving for a food you've never tried, even if the food is known for being delicious or a food that is tasty, but that doesn't fit your personal flavor preferences. So cravings are not a physiological phenomenon, but more so a mental construct. So the first factor that causes us to experience food cravings are food cues. Most of us experience cravings as a result of food cues, which can include seeing a food in our environment, or watching a commercial, an advertisement, or seeing a delicious food being promoted on social media, or even by smelling a food, so the aroma of food. And this is referred to as a cue-based craving. Often these cues can activate regions in the brain involved in reward, pleasure, and memory formation, which can play a role in driving your desire to have that specific food. A 2014 study looked at the, both the influence of hunger and food cues in the formation of cravings, and found that food craving was specifically associated with and triggered by palatable food cues and hedonic hunger, meaning hunger that's driven to experience pleasure, not true physiological hunger. On to the next factor. Although cravings are more related to food cues and hedonic hunger than physiological hunger, it is important to realize that unmanaged hunger, such as going long periods of time without eating, can increase the experience of food cravings. So a 2007 study found that there's a relationship between the level of hunger and susceptibility to experience cravings, which is why it's important to realize and to prioritize nutrient-dense whole foods that are highly satiating and to make sure that you get in sufficient protein and fiber to help reduce and manage your appetite as reducing hunger will reduce the likelihood of you experiencing cravings. And this is also why I recommend to never go food shopping hungry as then you're in a situation where you've stacked two factors that can drive cravings, which are being exposed to a ton of food cues because think about a grocery store, they're all around you. 
and excessive amounts of hunger. And in this case, you'll be more likely to experience cravings and pick up foods that aren't in alignment with your goals, especially when passing the baked goods sections of your grocery store. So you're passing the baked goods and you're smelling the aromas and it's going to cause cravings and it's going to leave you in less of a position to succeed because you're going to be more likely to give into those things, to go grab the, the baked good, to go grab a muffin or whatever it may be. The next factor that drives cravings are hypoplatable foods, specifically those which include refined combinations of sugar, starch, and fat. In 2002, researchers developed what's referred to as the food craving inventory. And their research specifically found three key characteristics of food that make it more likely for us to crave. So these three characteristics are a high fat content, a high starch content, and a sweet taste. Now, a 2018 study looked at how combining refined fats and starches impact our food reward and found that combinations of high fat and carb content in foods cause the greatest activation in our brain's reward pathways through the production of dopamine, which is why highly processed foods often feature this highly addictive combo of high amounts of refined fats and starches and or sugars. And this study was also the first to scientifically demonstrate that foods high in fat and carbohydrate are calorie for calorie, valued more than foods containing only fat or only carbohydrate. And this effect is associated with greater recruitment of central reward circuits in the brain, which can drive up cravings and our likelihood of overeating. The next factor that increases our drive for cravings is our emotional state. So our emotional state and our mood plays a really important role in the development of cravings. As research finds that when we're experiencing an unpleasant emotion, such as boredom or anxiety, we tend to experience more food cravings, and we're often more likely to hyperfixate on those uh, food cravings as a result of this uncomfortable emotion. And this is especially true if you're someone who has used food as a temporary escape from your problems or emotions and now have adopted this maladaptive habit where you engage in emotional eating, boredom eating, or mindless eating when you're going through one of those uncomfortable situations. Now, research finds that the reason why we frequently crave certain foods, specifically chocolate, is because chocolate is engineered to be extremely pleasurable to eat and highly rewarding when doing so. A 2000 study found that the motivation to eat is higher during a negative emotion, and in this state, participants tend to eat to provide distraction, to relax, or to feel better in the moment. In one study, they looked at the relationship between food cravings, dietary restraint, and mood. And their analysis found that food craving was only weakly related to dietary restraint, but highly and significantly correlated with external eating, meaning eating, eating driven by hunger or by food cues. It was also significantly correlated with emotional eating and susceptibility to hunger. And these researchers went on to conduct a second phase of the study where they took women who regularly experience food cravings and women who rarely experience food cravings and had them keep records of their food intake, their daily mood state, and their food craving episodes. They found that those in the cravers group, so those that were more likely to experience food cravings, ate more calories per day on average and had higher ratings of boredom and anxiety prior to experiencing and engaging in craving-related behaviors. This study also found that dietary restraint, including dieting and being in a deficit is not a necessary condition for food cravings to occur, and rather that food cravings are closely associated with mood as having a negative mood state can prompt cravings. So overall, the four factors that drive food cravings the most are the food cues we're exposed to, unmanaged hunger, which has not been addressed through proper dietary approaches, hyperplatable foods, specifically those in, with high carb and fat combos, and you know, being in an unpleasant or uncomfortable emotional state. If you guys would like to hear more about any of these factors and hear me break them down in greater detail, I recommend you go back to the How to Reduce Overeating series as I discuss food cues in detail in episode 102 on how your food environment is limiting you from getting lean. I broke down the impact that both highly processed and hyperplatable foods have on our eating behaviors, our calorie intake, our body composition, and our likelihood to overeat in episode 101. And I went over how emotions, including stress and boredom, can drive emotional eating and mindless eating in episode 103. So you guys can hear a ton more about each of these subjects if you go back to those episodes as they do tie into the topic of cravings. But I'm going to go deeper into the actual uh, nuances of cravings in this episode so you guys can go back to the previous episodes to get a better foundational understanding of all those other topics. The next topic I want to cover is how food cravings can impact your calorie intake, body fat levels, and body composition. We see in the literature that those 
who give in to food cravings more often tend to have higher BMIs and higher body fat levels. And this is due to the fact that most individuals who experience cravings try to satisfy those cravings by eating the hyperplatable, calorie-dense food items which they have cravings for. However, due to the appetite dysregulating effects that these foods have and the very low satiety and fullness they provide, the vast majority of individuals who try to feed their cravings end up being unable to moderate their intake of these calorie-packed foods, which lead them to consuming higher calorie intakes and accumulating more body fat over time. Research finds that food cravings and your food cue reactivity is related to greater weight gain over time and a higher BMI over the life course. So for example, in 2016, a meta-analytic review was conducted to look at the relationship between food cue reactivity, food cravings, and weight gain. And this meta-analysis looked at 45 studies and close to 3,300 participants and found that food cue exposure and the cravings they cause significantly influence our eating behaviors and significantly contribute to weight gain. They also found that visual food cues of any form, including photos and videos of food, like what you'd see in an advertisement or commercial, on TV or even on social media, were associated with a similar effect size on craving and eating behaviors as real food exposure, which is crazy to think about because you're getting a similar effect in terms of its effect on your eating behaviors than you would if you had, say, a donut in front of you as compared to an advertisement from Dunkin' Donuts. The vast majority of the research we have on cravings and body composition outcomes also finds that successful dieters give into cravings less often, which is one of the correlates of successful weight loss and weight loss maintenance, which is why if you want to be able to get lean and stay lean, you should look to reduce the frequency of consumption of the foods you crave the most, as the majority of individuals have a very poor ability to moderate their calorie intake from the, from the foods they crave the most, so it often results in them overeating these foods. Research also finds that the frequency of eating the foods you crave most has a more significant impact and influence on your likelihood of craving these foods in the future, even when compared to the amount of these foods you consume in a single sitting. So even if you are someone who can moderate your intake of the foods you crave, if you want to reduce your cravings of these foods, the most effective way to accomplish this is to reduce your intake of them, especially in terms of how often you consume them. So what we actually see is that it's a more effective approach to just reduce the amount of times that you eat something. So for instance, if you are someone that is eating chocolate on an everyday basis, you're more likely to experience food cravings, even if it's in a small amount. And so we see that it, that's more influential than having a large amount. And it's not that I'm implying or suggesting or even you know, uh, alluding to the fact that, or encouraging the fact that you should overeat when you're having any one of these foods. However, if you really want to reduce your likelihood of experienced food cravings, you need to first focus on the frequency in which you're eating these foods, because that constant exposure to those same foods cause a reinforcement effect, which causes this conditioning where you're more likely to seek out those foods, want those foods, and crave those foods. Now, the next topic I wanna to cover is how dieting impacts food cravings. As this is the component of food cravings and the area of food cravings that is most misunderstood. I've seen many individuals, especially those in like the anti-dieting community, claim that dieting is what causes food cravings. And this is another example of individuals not actually reading and understanding the research literature correctly and confusing correlation with causation. Whenever I hear someone say that dieting is the primary reason why someone is experiencing a specific food craving, it's a clear indication to me that they've not only, they not only haven't dug into the research on this topic, but they actually haven't worked with clients in the real world, as that's not what we see in the literature, nor what we see when you work with clients and have dieted a large subsect of individuals of all different backgrounds. And the reason why many believe that dieting causes food cravings is because when you initially go into an energy deficit and go from a place of eating tasty calorie-dense foods in excess to consistently maintaining a deficit and losing a significant amount of body fat, your hunger levels are going to increase. This is a natural physiological effect, and it's one of the most prominent metabolic adaptations that are induced through dieting. So when you've been used to eating a diet comprised of hyperplayable foods, you've already created neural adaptations where your brain has reinforced these foods as being pleasurable and has associated them with as being a very plentiful source of calories. So when you go into calorie deficit and your hunger levels increase from consuming less calories than you're burning, you're going to experience an increased desire for these foods, especially because in your brain, it's associating with the fact that these are high calorie foods. So this is a, a great survival mechanism, essentially. However, the longer you go without the hyperplatable foods you crave, the less you'll crave them as cravings weaken over time, 
when you don't expose yourself to the foods you're craving and you don't consume them. So you're not reinforcing that, that essentially that phenomenon in the brain where it, it seeks out these foods. And this is why trials looking at continuous calorie restriction, aka dieting, find that cravings lower over time when the diet is adhered to. And this is especially true if you shift if you shift to a more nutrient dense diet, which is what I've seen with hundreds of clients who have dieted down over the years. When I take a new client on, I will usually start them in what I refer to as a primer phase, where the goal is to get them into a better position, both physiologically and psychologically, to push for a more specific goal after we complete the primer phase together. However, during the primer phase, I place a large emphasis on improving a client's foundation, both from a nutrition and a training perspective. And this often includes shifting them from a diet that's filled with foods such as hyperplayable, energy dense foods to a more whole foods based diet, which features nutrient dense food sources that provide them with the macro and micronutrients they need so that their body fires on all cylinders. As I always tell my clients, that a healthy body is a responsive body. Yet there are many clients who come to me who are not only unhappy with how their body composition looks, but they're also suffering negative metabolic effects and health consequences from having excess body fat. And these could include things like having poor insulin sensitivity, high blood lipids, and high blood pressure. So during this primer phase, my goal is to help them lose body fat and improve these health markers so that their body is more responsive and better able to handle and partition nutrients, better able to train harder and recover more efficiently and build muscle more effectively. And in order to improve their health and body composition, I'll often start them around their maintenance intake and then eventually transition them into a deficit once we've built a solid foundation where they're consistently nailing their nutrition, their fluid intake, they're training in a progressive, uh, productive manner, they're sleeping well, and their biofeedback is in a good place. Yet despite the fact that I keep most clients at maintenance calories during the initial part of the primer phase, they usually report the most cravings during the first one to four weeks when we're working together. As this is the period of time that's closest to when they were just on their previous diet, which was generally filled with these tasty, hyperplatable processed foods, which caused the most cravings. And what I notice is that over time, my clients report experiencing less and less cravings. And this is even true once I transition them from maintenance into a calorie deficit. So if dieting caused cravings, they wouldn't experience any cravings at maintenance and at the start of us working together, yet they would experience the most cravings during the active fat loss portion of the phase. But that's the exact opposite of what I see. And many of my clients out there who are listening to this podcast will be able to reflect back on our first primer phase together, or even our, just our first phase together. And remember that they reported the most cravings early on when we first started working together. But I have tons of clients who I've been working with for some time now, and they experience cravings far less now than when we first started working together due to the fact that we've improved the nutrient density of their diet, we've worked on their habits and behaviors around nutrition, and have also improved their mindset and perspective on nutrition. So if it was that dieting induced greater likelihoods or a greater experience of cravings, we wouldn't see this to be the case. Now, that's my own personal anecdote, having coached well over 1,100 clients over the past 11 plus years. But what does the research literature find and how being in a calorie deficit influences food cravings? So a 2017 study looked into the etiology, aka the cause of food cravings, and found that food cravings are a result of conditioning where the consumption of certain foods get paired with either an internal or external stimuli, such as an emotion like anxiety or stress, or a situation like watching TV. And after a few, a few times of pairing the consumption of these foods with that stimulus, when you experience that stimulus again, it elicits cravings for those same foods that you previously consumed when that stimulus was present. What this means is, if you turn to food when you're feeling stressed or anxious, or when you engage in certain activities, such as when you get home from work or you sit down to watch a movie, you're essentially conditioning yourself to create a habit out of consuming those foods when you experiencing when you experience those emotions or engage in those situations, especially if you turn to hyperplayable comfort foods, which drive dopamine release and have a stronger reinforcement value and reinforcement effect. And this is also why we see in the vast majority of the research that when individuals undergo a period of calorie restriction where they avoid specific foods, their food cravings for those foods decrease because just like we can condition ourselves to experience more cravings by consuming a specific food more often, we can actually reduce those cravings by reducing our frequency of consuming those same foods that we crave. I'm also going to read out an excerpt from this, from this study, which is extremely powerful as it shows that dieting can actually reduce cravings rather than increase them. So let me pull this up. So the author stated, and I quote, 
Food restriction during dieting limits conditioning opportunities and extinguishes existing associations between the stimuli and food intake. Importantly, studies have found that restriction of certain food groups, including carbohydrates, during diets resulted in larger reductions in cravings for those restricted foods. Now, this is just one study that shows this, but we have a large body of literature looking at the effects of calorie restriction on food cravings, which shows that dieting can be one of the most effective ways to reduce food cravings due to the fact that when you're trying to maintain a deficit to successfully lose body fat, you often need to either reduce or cut out hyperplatable foods out of your diet. And these also happen to be the foods that are most often craved. So by minimizing or eliminating those foods, you're able to reduce your exposure to them and also, also extinguish your cravings for them over time. Now, if it were true that calorie restriction in dieting increased food cravings, then being in a larger deficit would increase your likelihood of experiencing food cravings more as compared to being in a smaller deficit, because that would, you know, that would be in line with a lot of the claims that people make. However, this has been tested multiple times in the literature, and we actually see the opposite. So for example, in a 2006 study, researchers looked at the changes in food cravings during low calorie and very low calorie diets. And to test this, they used the food craving inventory to measure general cravings and cravings for specific food types that many struggle with. So this included things such as sweets, high fat foods, high carbohydrate foods, and fast food, um, like fat packed foods. So things that we would get like junk food essentially, or things we would get at a fast food restaurant. And then they split participants into two groups. One group was put on a 1200 calorie diet and they were referred to as the low calorie group. And the other group was put on an 800 calorie diet per day. And these individuals were in the very low calorie group. And these groups followed these diets for six weeks followed by five weeks of refeeding. They found that both groups experienced substantial decreases in food cravings throughout the dieting period. But the very low calorie diet group that was on 800 calories per day experienced more significant reductions in every single measure of food cravings than the low calorie diet group that was eating 1200 calories per day. So this study found that dieting and calorie restriction helps to diminish food cravings, not to increase them. Another study investigated the effects of food cravings on very low calorie diets versus a low calorie diet. And to test this, they randomly assigned participants to either a balanced low calorie diet, or which was essentially between 1,000 to 1,200 calories per day with all foods allowed in moderation, or they were put on this 12-week period of a very low calorie diet where their calorie intake was restricted down to 400 calories per day, so very, very low calorie. And the only food source that they had within their diet was lean meats, fish, and fowl. So this is very limited in terms of food choices as well as energy intake. And they found significant decreases in cravings for all food types over the course of the study for those on both the low calorie and the very low calorie diets. So both diets had the effects of reducing food cravings. Then in a 2018 study, they looked at the effects of two low-fat diets on reductions in food cravings. And both diets were matched for calories and low in fat, but one diet was a high-protein diet and the other diet was a high-carbohydrate diet. They had participants follow one of these diets for 12 weeks, where each group lost a significant amount of weight that was similar to one another. So they both lost very, amount, very similar amounts of weight. And then they had to maintain that weight loss for another 12 weeks following this 12-week dieting phase. They found that all food cravings decreased over the 24-week study with sweets and fast food cravings, loss of control, and emotional cravings specifically being reduced following the active weight loss portion of the trial. So when they had been in a deficit and they were restricting their food intake, they actually saw a massive reduction, a significant reduction in their cravings for sweets, for fast foods, loss of control over eating, and emotional cravings. They also found that obsessive preoccupation with food decreased following both the weight loss phase and the maintenance phase. So both the high protein and high carbohydrate diets provided significant reductions in food cravings after similar weight losses and were maintained once weight was stabilized. So when it comes to the impact that dieting has on food cravings, reducing your consumption of the foods you crave most in order to reach your fat loss and your body composition goals can actually help reduce your likelihood of experiencing excessive food cravings, not to increase them. So this is a common fallacy within the nutrition industry where people will mis-extrapolate and, and misattribute the causes of a certain phenomenon, such as cravings, to dieting when that's just not the case. And we don't see that in the literature anywhere, to be honest with you. And so the next topic I want to cover is why we tend to crave certain foods more than others. When you have cravings, you're experiencing a state of heightened eating motivation that is directed at a very specific food. 
And cravings are not something you control as they come on unconsciously. So it's not something that we're asking to experience and none of us want to experience food cravings. But you are in control of the two biggest factors that influence them, which are your eating behaviors, including the foods you choose to eat. So do you choose to eat and expose yourself to hyperplatable foods or to nutrient dense foods that you're not going to create? And your food environment, which can either help you avoid cravings or make them worse. And your food choices are especially important as we have receptors in our stomach that measure food characteristics like the starch, sugar, fat, and salt content. And the more heavily concentrated amounts of these you ingest, the more dopamine is produced, which increases your drive and motivation towards these certain foods. When you get a dopamine spike from the foods you've eaten, especially hyperplatable ones, it results in two things. The first thing is it, it results in an increased motivational state to keep doing what you're doing and to keep engaging in the behaviors that are causing that dopamine spike, which is why it's so easy to keep eating ice cream or chocolate or any of these treats and sweets once you've started eating them. And it also causes you to learn from what you're eating and forms memories around the smell, the taste, the visual and other sensory aspects of the food you're eating, and that experience including where you had it and who you ate it with that's causing that dopamine release, which is why we have so many foods tied to previous memories that we look fondly on. So it could be grandma's cookies, or it could be um, maybe Sunday dinner that you had with your family, or a certain restaurant, or maybe it's a specific food that you always went to. So for me in particular, I no longer eat this food because I realized that my ability to control my consumption of it was just not in a level or not in a place where it was conducive for my long-term physique goals. But I'll tell you, in college, every single Sunday, I had pizza Sunday, which was essentially a cheat day. And it was, I didn't have a good relationship with food and I ate pizza in excess. And it was every time I would drive by a specific pizzeria that was in the town that I lived in during college, I would get cravings. I could just drive past it quickly. But if I smelled the aroma, if I looked at it, if I saw a picture of the pizza, it always brought me back to those memories. And I'm lucky to say that I looked into this literature years ago and I realized that the best way to reduce and to stop experiencing very specific cravings is to stop exposing myself to these things. So one year for New Year's, um, I actually did a New Year's resolution where I decided to give up pizza for the year and I've never had it again. And I don't crave it. I don't want it. I can look at it. Someone can eat it in front of me and it doesn't bother me at this point, but this is because I'm years removed. And I don't have that same association with it because I've went so long without having eaten it or exposed myself to it. And during the time, that first year where I gave it up, I wasn't looking at food porn of pizza. I wasn't going to pizzerias. It's the same thing as a smoker or an alcoholic. It's like, if you can't moderate your consumption of certain things, maybe you should look to reduce or eliminate them. And so when we look at this, the two outcomes of, of eating these types of foods cause even more issues. For one, the motivated state you experience while consuming these foods lead you to overeating these items in the moment due to the increased desire to eat these foods. In addition, the learning experience your brain undergoes while eating these foods that raise dopamine cause you to be triggered to crave these same food items whenever you're in a situation where some of the same sensory stimuli are present, which is why you can experience cravings after walking past one of your favorite restaurants, which is the experience that I was recounting personally. And even just, just seeing an image of a food on social media or TV can drive these cravings and desire to get these foods, which is why so many people experience heightened food focus when viewing food porn, especially on like those uh, food porn pages on social media, which is something I, I often recommend clients to stay as far away from as possible because it can often just make the process of dieting much more difficult. And engaging in these behaviors throws, throws off your ability to stay on track with your nutritional habits as then you have to fight off these urges even more. And being able to improve your body composition by sticking to a nutrient dense diet can be challenging enough for many people that have habits and behaviors that have not, you know, from their past that have not served them up until this point. So we want to make things as easy as possible for us and as efficient and effective of a process as possible. So the last topic I want to cover on today's show is what foods trigger cravings the most? Because I think understanding this will allow you guys to be more aware and be able to look out for some of these foods and see if they're causing you triggers or triggering cravings within your own life, within, all, within your own eating behaviors. So the foods that cause the largest spike in dopamine trigger food cravings the most. And this includes concentrated forms of sugar, starch, fat, and salt. And the likelihood of experienced cravings are increased even more when these items are combined within a food. And this is why you'll notice that the foods you most commonly crave, crave are those that are usually highly processed and hyperpalatable. As these foods are engineered to combine rewarding food properties and a high energy density or a high amount of calories, which they do and they accomplish by combining sugar, salt, and fat to activate the reward pathways in your brain, 
which is why these foods are so hard to moderate and control your consumption of once you start eating them and why they often trigger you to want more of them even after you finish eating them. When we look at the research on the most highly craved foods, we see that many fall in the category of hyperplatable foods. For example, in a 1999 or 1991 study, um, researchers conducted a study that looked at the prevalence and specificity of food cravings in over a thousand men and women. The results found that 97% of women and 68% of men reported experiencing food cravings on a regular basis. Chocolate was the most frequently reported food craved, especially amongst women. They also found that the most highly craved foods were in the following order. So number one was chocolate. Number two was pizza. Number three were salty foods, including things like chips. Number four was ice cream. And number five was sweets and desserts. Then in 2015, a two-part study was conducted, which analyzed what foods people are most addicted to. Now, the topic of food addiction is one that there's still a lot of debate about in the nutrition industry, um, because food as a general category is not an addictive substance. But we do have research that finds that there are certain foods that have addictive properties, which cause us to engage in overeating and problematic eating behaviors when we include them in our diets. And so within this study, they did a two-part study. And in study one, they found that processed foods and those higher in fats and carbs were most frequently associated with addictive-like eating behaviors. So for example, in the study, they found that the top 10 problematic foods were in this order. So number one was chocolate. Number two was ice cream. Number three were French fries. Number four was pizza. Number five were cookies. Number six were chips. Number seven was cake. Number eight was buttered popcorn. Number nine were cheeseburgers. And number 10 were muffins. Now, I want you to think about what these foods all have in common. They're all hyperplatable processed foods, which feature highly concentrated amounts of refined fats and carbohydrates. Then when we look at the bottom 10 foods that were reported as being, uh, being the least problematic or the least likely to overeat or have cravings for, we have items like apples, corn with no butter or salt. We have salmon, bananas, plain carrots, brown rice, water, cucumbers, broccoli, and the last on the list is beans. So these are all single ingredient whole foods. Then in part two of their study, so in the second study that they conducted, they found that the top 10 addictive foods were pizza, chocolate, chips, cookie, uh, cookies, ice cream, French fries, uh, cheeseburgers, uh, sugar sweetened beverages, including soda. So not diet soda, but regular soda and cake. Whereas the bottom 10 included items like strawberries, plain corn, salmon, bananas, broccoli, brown rice, apples, beans, carrots, and cucumber. And if you notice, these are on the list of like problematic foods that people crave the most. These are all processed food sources that are highly concentrated with a combination of the nutrients that increase dopamine release the most. And these lists show that the most commonly craved items are either fatty and sweet or fatty and savory foods. So when it comes to what foods are most likely to trigger cravings, they tend to be a high fat and carbohydrate combo, which is not something we'd find in nature. And much of, much of the research that we have on food cravings finds that chocolate tends to be the most commonly craved food, with some studies finding that 49% of all food cravings are for a form of chocolate. So chocolate is one of the most highly craved items we have available to us, and this is for several reasons. We crave, crave chocolate because it's calorie dense, so it triggers a large amount of dopamine release from our brains. It's a highly concentrated form of refined sugar and fat, which makes it have a very high food reward. So it's reinforcing effects. It makes us want to go back for more. Uh, it has no water content. So it's very energy dense. It has a lot of calories packed into a small amount of, of food volume, essentially. So it's easy to overeat due to providing little satiety to us. This is another fact that a lot of people aren't aware of, but chocolate actually has a habit forming drug called theobromine, which is very similar to caffeine. It's actually within the same uh, family of um, stimulants as caffeine. And this is why in research, we see that chocolate is the number one craved food in general populations around the world, especially in women. So however, what we have to realize is that chocolate cravings are very specific because cravings are specific. So uh, we, when we look at chocolate cravings, they're often for a specific and exact chocolate that it, the individual prefers, not for chocolate in general. So in one study, they took individuals who had high levels of chocolate cravings and wanted to see if it was the properties within milk chocolate that caused the craving and, and also provided them with the pleasure when eating it, or if it was simply due to the taste and their mental association with the experience of eating chocolate. In order to test this, they took chocolate cravers and had them go through four conditions when they were experiencing a chocolate craving. So in one condition, they consumed a regular milk chocolate bar. 
In the next condition, they consumed a calorie matched amount of white chocolate. So still a chocolate form, but a different form than they were used to eating or they reported liking. In one condition, they put the pharmacological amounts and components of chocolate into cocoa capsules. So this was essentially a supplemental form. And only when these experiences ate the real chocolate bar were they pleased by the experience, which indicates that there's no role for pharmacological effects in the satisfaction of chocolate cravings. It also suggests a role for aroma independent of sweetness, texture, and calories. And this is really that we have an experience with chocolate and we essentially associate a specific chocolate with a feeling that we get from it. So it could be that you always go for a Hershey's chocolate bar when you're feeling upset or distraught. And that is your, your escape essentially. So it's not that any chocolate is going to do, and it really shows that cravings are not, are psychological, not physiological. Now, one commonality between the foods we crave most are that they trigger the bliss point of food. So the bliss point of food is the optimal ratio of sugar, fat, and salt that simulates the reward center in the brain. And it's many of the most well-known and lucrative food companies employ brilliant food scientists to engineer and create foods that elicit the perfect bliss point, which activates this reward pathway in our brains and spikes our dopamine production, resulting in us craving more and more of these hyperplatable processed frankenfoods. And these hyperplatable food sources are so easy to overconsume because they're designed to dysregulate our appetite, increase cravings, and boost our drive and motivation to consume these items, which is often why we can we crave these foods the most. So I hope this episode provided you all with greater insight to what causes food cravings and what factors drive them, as cravings are something we all experience, but many misunderstand. So as always, guys, thank you for listening to another episode of the Chasing Clarity podcast. I currently have uh, my coaching roster open, which I announced on last week's episode. So if any of you are interested in one-on-one -on -one nutrition training and lifestyle coaching, feel free to reach out to me through my email, which is bdecruzfitness at gmail.com, or you guys can find me on Instagram at brandedecruz underscore. And please remember to follow the show, whether that be on Spotify or iTunes, leave us a review and share this episode on your stories, which I always appreciate every single one of you guys who do, uh, does that and allows me to help reach more and more people so that all of you out there who listen to this show can look better, feel better and function better and really understand these concepts in a greater amount of detail and be able to understand a lot of the things that you're going through and improve your habits, behaviors, and, event, and essentially be able to get a better body composition and a better health and life in the process. So as always, guys, hope you have a great weekend and I'll talk to you next week. Peace.